Good morning. So there's a lot of talk about AI in the media, and I always like to start with sort of the, what does the public think about AI? Well, they usually think about this guy, right, which is not really what we're interested in, killer robots, nor are we really interested in sexy driverless cars, although I would like one. Um, what we really are interested more in is what can we do with, say, machine learning. So in our daily lives, this is going to be something like Google search engine that pulls up what you're looking for before you get there, or even more importantly, something like Google Maps, which is taking all of this complex information about traffic, making some predictive modeling uh, decisions, and giving you a specific decision about how to get from, say, LAX to USC campus through the horror of LA traffic. And these sorts of planning algorithms are something that we've become particularly excited about in our work in the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Society. Now, a lot of times when we start talking about this collaboration between um, people within social science and within social work in particular and with artificial intelligence, people oftentimes ask us, well, what exactly are you doing? I mean, you know, the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence and Society could mean a, any number of different things. And so what we're really thinking about when we're talking about these issues is we are thinking about um, a couple of orienting perspectives around major social problems in the world. So the first is the grand challenges of social work. And I've, there's a, there are 12 grand challenges of social work, and I've just listed a few here, but particularly things like ending homelessness and stopping family violence and ensuring the healthy development of youth. These are the sorts of problems that we're really interested in. And we're also very interested in, as I'm sure you would imagine being in this room today, in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And there's an enormous amount of overlap between these two things. So ending homelessness and ending poverty globally, these things have an enormous amount of overlap. So it's not like these are two disparate sets of goals. It's really that one is a more domestic focus of goals and the other is a more international focus of goals. But it's these sorts of major social problems that are facing us in the world that we're trying to handle with the work that we do. And so specifically when we're thinking about our programs, we really break them down into three groups. And the, and the first group we really think about as assisting low resource communities. So this is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about this morning. It's going to be talking about homelessness and HIV. We also have some really exciting results from the program that we led. So these relatively rough looking young people in the, in the top slides. We're going to talk about how we got them to be these happy, smiling young people who are empowered in, in the bottom slides. because Those are actually the youth we worked with. And we also have some future projects that we'll talk a little bit about at the end, uh, revolving around substance use and suicide prevention. So two um, other areas of work. One area you have heard about uh, yesterday from Fei Fang which is uh, AI for conservation. You heard about the projects that are going on, uh, in particular in Africa, for uh, conserving wildlife. Uh, this is uh, against poaching. So you heard about snares being placed and how AI techniques can be used to predict where snares are placed and can be removed before animals get killed. You heard from Liz Bondi about uh, you drone-based patrolling and spotting uh, poachers and animals uh, uh, from nighttime video. So these are ongoing projects. In the past, uh, we've also worked on and uh, continue to try to work with the U.S. Coast Guard for patrolling in the Gulf of Mexico. This is against illegal fishing. Or work in Madagascar. This is uh, for trying to uh, prevent illegal logging. So these are all projects in the space of uh, AI for Earth, AI and conservation that are ongoing at the center. Another, uh, the third area of work that's ongoing is AI for public safety and security. Faye may have briefly mentioned. The basic challenge here is that we have limited security resources and a large number of targets to protect. How do you then schedule or plan or allocate limited resources taking into account a watchful adversary? We've been appealing to game theory and by solving massive scale security games, generating these sorts of allocations, schedules, and so forth. This is work that uh, we've done, for example, with the U.S. Transportation Security Administration. Uh, our work is in use by the Federal Air Marshal Service for assigning air marshals to flights. If you've been on a U.S. air carrier on an international flight, whether there was an air marshal or not on your flight may have been decided by this game theoretic software. 
or patrolling around a Staten Island ferry or patrols done by the Coast Guard in different ports like New York and Boston. This is all game theory being applied for public safety and security work done uh, by our PhD students. If you go back to the LAX airport, if you see checkpoints, that's also um, our software. Where this work is going is uh, we're very excited by our international collaborators uh, using this work. For example, uh, in Israel, uh, our colleagues and collaborators using this for traffic monitoring. Um, Pradeep may talk about work uh, that he is doing with the Singapore Police Force in patrolling uh, around Singapore. Colleagues in uh, uh, Chile and Argentina using this for interdicting drug trafficking, again using the security games ideas. So all of this work requires partnerships. Um, we talked yesterday, about, I mean, in each of these areas, we talked yesterday about the importance of uh, partnerships. For low resource communities, it's partnerships with the homeless shelters. Uh, for uh, public safety and security, it's partnerships with uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Transportation Security Administration or the U.S. Coast Guard or the local law enforcement agencies here. And for wildlife conservation is partnerships with the uh, WCS that we heard about yesterday or uh, Air Shepherd or other NGOs. It's with these partnerships that this kind of work can go on. The work we'll talk about today and the work uh, that uh, we you know, that's going on at the center has been largely published in this uh, AMAS, uh, AAA Anichka in the AI literature. If you wanted to know more uh, background, there's, uh, there's these books um, uh, that, uh, that we have, Security and Game Theory, the new book that will come out, Improving Homeland Security, and a brand new book uh, maybe will come out uh, within a year, Artificial Intelligence and Social Work. And so if you buy uh, these books uh, from the royalties, we can take our PhD students out to a nice dinner. So this is uh, just a plug for these books. Um, so key t as you listen to this talk, there's three key takeaways uh, that you should, you should have from this. One, there's significant potential for AI uh, to assist in low resource communities. These are not just applications, but there are significant research challenges here, not only in terms of the fundamental computational challenges from the user-inspired research, but also in designing AI systems in society. We have to think about interpretability and complementing human autonomy. What's the right level of autonomy when we have these human-machine partnerships? And finally, there are methodological challenges as well for our field. When we have this kind of interdisciplinary research, we need uh, right kinds of publication venues. We have to think about measuring impact in society. We can't just uh, develop algorithms and be done when the algorithms are published. We have to know what they do for real I in society. And that's something that is important, and we'll come back to this a little later on. Today's talk uh, will focus mostly on the low resource communities. And uh, as we go along, you will see pictures of our PhD students uh, at the top right hand corner, people who actually led the effort. So with this, I'll hand over to Eric uh, and I'll start the video uh, that will show you one of our PhD students who did uh, work with the homeless youth. At the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence in Society, we are researching ways to leverage the power of social networks to address complex social problems. My colleagues and I have focused on one particular problem, how to use artificial intelligence techniques to prevent the spread of HIV amongst homeless youth. In Los Angeles County, homelessness has reached a crisis level, with nearly 47,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night. Homelessness is and has to be our top priority. After all, real lives are on the line. Sometimes overlooked in this conversation is the increasing number of homeless youth. There are up to 6,000 homeless young people sleeping on the streets in Los Angeles. These homeless youth are 10 times more likely to be exposed to HIV due to high-risk activities such as unprotected sex and needle sharing. Among housed youth, less than one half of 1% have HIV. Yet among homeless youth, nearly 10% are infected. Educating all these youth about HIV is a necessity, but this goal is unachievable due to limited resources. So that's just a brief uh, introduction. So you can see Amolia, who did a lot of the, the work here, and so you can see some pictures of actual homeless youth. It's um, the, the statistics that, that Amolia quoted <clears throat> were from last year. As of this year, there are now 
almost 58,000 homeless people every night on the streets of Los Angeles, and 6,000 of those are youth uh, between the ages of 13 and 24 who are unaccompanied. There's maybe as many as 2 million young people who experience one night of homelessness every year. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction into what some of the challenges faced by these young people and who these young people are so that you can get a sense of just who these folks are that we're trying to do this work with. So one of the things that's really important to understand is that there's a lot of uh, cyclical nature to housing for homeless youth. So they're not just sleeping outside 100% of the time. They are going from place to place. So they'll be staying in strangers' homes. They'll be staying in the f in homes of their friends or relatives for brief periods of time. They'll stay on you know, city streets, benches, in emergency shelters. And it's this instability of housing that really characterizes homeless youth more so than sort of the stereotype that I think a lot of people have of homeless individuals, of somebody who is pushing a shopping cart down the street or sleeping in a nest of detritus. Um, you know, that's not really what homeless youth look like. They are, they are very careful about being invisible most of the time so that they can avoid being victimized. So in Los Angeles, these young people are very much a, a racial and ethnically heterogeneous group of young people. Lots of African American youth, lots of Latino youth, lots of mixed race youth, lots of white youth. It really, um, but disproportionately impacting uh, youth of color. We also see that primarily homeless youth on the streets are boys. That's partly uh, because it's more dangerous to be on the streets as a girl and also girls have more opportunities to leverage their sexuality to get places to stay. So there's kind of a push-pull factor that happens here. Um, one of the things that most people don't understand about homeless youth is that an enormous number of them are LGBT, lesbian, gay, gay bisexual, transgender youth. It's almost 40% of the population are these LGBT youth, and mostly that's because these young people are either thrown out of religiously conservative families or they've run away from families or communities where they feel very much discriminated against because of their choices and, and identities around sexual, uh, sexuality and sexual uh, and gender uh, identity. In Los Angeles, there's also this myth that everyone who's in Los Angeles who's a homeless youth was here because they came to become a star and then th that didn't happen and they ended up on the streets. That's sort of a 1970s after school special bit of nonsense. Actually, most of the people who are on the streets of LA that are young people uh, grew up in Los Angeles or Southern California. And there are an, a large number of young people who are from other communities, but those are primarily, as I was talking about before, a lot of it is LGBT youth and other youth who are running away from violence and abuse. So one of the things that, that's important to understand about homeless youth is that um, an enormous number of them have experienced violence. So almost half of them have been in the foster care system, and I would argue that the other half probably should have been. Uh, the amount of violence and, and abuse that you see in this population is almost 80%. Um, it's in terms of having been physically or sexually abused at some point in their lives. Um, there's an enormous number of young people who've also been in the juvenile justice system. And one of the things I think that's probably most surprising to people that when I talk about this is that these are young people between the ages of 13 and 24, and almost 10% of them have a child with them out on the street. So you actually have two generations of kids that we're, that we're talking about. And one of the issues that faces these young people in numbers that wildly outpace the rest of the country is risk of HIV. So some surveillance studies have seen rates of HIV as high as 11% among homeless youth. Uh, one of my doctoral students, Robin Petering, did a study last summer where she interviewed about 200 homeless youth and she asked them about their histories of HIV testing and what their HIV uh, status was. And she found that 7% of them, of these young people, told her that they were HIV positive. And that's just the young people that know that they're HIV positive. And it's important to understand that nationally, in this age range, we're talking less than half of 1% have HIV. So there's a huge disparity. And, and something which is approaching uh, any HIV rate that is more than 3%, the CDC considers to be an epidemic level. And when one is talking about diseases in general, usually 10% is viewed as an epi the beginning of what an epidemic counts as. So this is an epidemic level of HIV, which is a shocking thing to see in any population. 
And with respect to HIV testing, even though a lot of these young people have had an HIV test at some point in their life, very few of them have gotten an HIV test in the last six months. And so if you don't get tested for HIV every three to six months, if you're in a high-risk sexual network like these young people are, you really don't know if you have HIV or not. And what we see here from some data that I did in the past, and this is looking at uh, several panels of data across the two major uh, networks that we work with. One is in Venice Beach, which is the safe place for youth, uh, young people, and the other one is my friend's place, which is the Hollywood-based young people. You can see here that you have anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of these young people haven't had an HIV test in the last six months. So this is really what we're trying to focus on in this project, is we're trying to think about how can we disseminate HIV knowledge in this group. And what we want to do in this project is we want to leverage the power of social networks. And so what we're trying to accomplish in this is what's referred to as a peer leader intervention. So something that's important to understand about homeless youth is that because of this history of abuse and neglect, foster care system involvement, juvenile justice system involvement, these young people do not trust adults. It's very, very, very difficult to build an, a trusting relationship with these young people that's very meaningful. So what our plan with these young people is, is that we're going to work with a small number of them, gain their trust, and train them to be our advocates in their networks to promote sexual health amongst their friends. And this is a model that's been used in a number of contexts around the world over the last 20 years, but never with homeless youth. Typically, it's been done with either young gay men or it's been done in community settings in places like sub-Saharan Africa, where there's also epidemic levels of HIV. And the challenge always becomes, how do you pick the right person to be your advocate? The typical way that public health thinks about solving this is by picking the most popular people. It's sort of a no-brainer obvious thought. Well, popular people have more friends. If we train them, they're going to have more impact in a network than if we just arbitrarily pick people. Unfortunately, sometimes you know, the public health versions of these interventions aren't even that smart. They'll just actually ask for volunteers. Like, who wants to be a health navigator in your network will take all comers, right? But what we're thinking about this is that we should be able to be much smarter about how we use these networks because these networks are very complicated and I'll show you some slides in a minute to show you just how complicated. And so we really want to figure out what's going on. What you need to understand about these networks is that they're complicated and they're unstable and they're uncertain. So this is some data from a, uh, a project that we did a couple of years ago in both Venice and in Hollywood. And when we interviewed young people in these networks once every six months for 18 months, what we found was that in Hollywood, about 60% of the young people that we interviewed the first time were gone by the time we went back to that, that uh, social location to interview everybody again. 60% of them were gone again the next time. In Venice Beach, it was even more transient. We only had about 15% of people that would carry over from one six-month period to the next. So one of the things that we're forced to do in this context is to map out networks, map them out quickly, act quickly because they're going to be shifting and changing. There's just an enormous amount of churn. Young, new young people end up homeless every day. New young people end up in some sort of stable housing. They go back home or they, go, or they get put in jail. So there's this churn, right? We are able to map these networks. It takes an enormous amount of work to do this. Um, in this case, this network map is of my friend's place. Uh, there's about 300 youth that are captured in this picture. The, 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 the colored dots are the youth themselves. The lines are what connects the youth to one another. And in order to create this network map, these linkages, the interviewing process that we went through is, is very intensive and re relies on young people telling us who their friends are and then us figuring out who they're talking about based on how they describe these friends to us. So there's the source of error that comes in based on how these young people, uh, who they remember to talk to us about, how they describe them, and then our capacity to deal with that information. And so we actually might be looking at a network like this. This is all the possible things that could have been going on in this network. This was our conservative matrix that we felt like we could really say, yes, we're certain about this. But it could have been this noisy and this messy. So this is really where AI enters the picture. So we want to pick these peer leaders. We've got a setting where we've got an enormous, complicated network. 
and we know that this network has uncertainty because of the way that we can collect the data and also because of the way that these relationships fracture and young people churn in and out of this system. So how then do we pick the best peer leaders? And so what we really want to do is we want to create this model where given this limited resource and limited capacity to reach and impact a small number of young people, who are the best young people so that we can reach everyone in this population so that everybody gets the testing that we need? And at this point, I got stumped. And so enters Milland and Amelia and their, and their AI. So now we turn to the uh, challenge of AI and influence maximization. And so let's talk about influence maximization in a social network. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with this, but for the benefit of those who may not be, let's just sort of quickly review what we are trying to do here. We have been given an input graph G, which is uh, possibly highly uncertain. There's some influence model I, and I'll explain what that, what that means. We're trying to choose K nodes per time step such that Overall, in expectation, we maximize the number of influenced nodes. And so what is this influence model I? Here we have um, two nodes A and B. There's a particular uh, probability associated with this edge, which is the pro probability that influence will propagate from node A to node B. If node A knows that HIV testing should be done, then there's a, a 0.4 chance that node B will get this information. Now, in our actual work, there's a slight modification to this model, but for the purposes of this talk, this is the model that we will use. Now, the challenges we face in this domain are that we are uncertain about the network state, about the network structure, and we have an adaptive selection problem. What I mean by uncertainty in network state is that we may be given this network and we may select node A uh, to give them information about HIV testing, for example, but whether that pro has propagated to node C or B uh, is unknown. So, e so later on, we can't be sure whether nodes C and B have this information or not. Secondly, the network itself is uncertain. So for example, here I'm showing you some edges which are shown by dashed lines. So we are uncertain whether these edges exist. That means the network may look like this, where there is no edge between A and B or C and D, or it may look uh, like this, where uh, you know, all the dashed lines do exist. Thirdly, uh, and so in order to model these um, uncertainty in these edges, we are going to have two types of edges in our graph, edges that we are certain about and edges we are uncertain about. For the edges that we are certain about, there's only one probability associated uh, with that edge, which is the probability of propagation, as I mentioned. But edges that we are uncertain about, there's going to be two probabilities associated with them. One is the probability of propagation, but then there is this U uh, probability, uh, whether the edge exists in the first place or not. So there's a 0.75 uh, probability that the edge exists. If it exists, then there's a 0.4 chance influ influence will propagate, but that edge may not exist at all, in which case there is no uh, propagation of influence. Now these are point estimates that I'm showing you here. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about how to relax uh, uh, these assumptions so that we may not be focused on these point probabilities, but may have, for example, uncertainty ranges. The third problem here is um, we have an adaptive selection problem. So the way this will work is we're given this network, some of these edges are uncertain. We'll bring in five youth at a time. We can only bring in five youth because that's a capacity limit of the homeless shelter that we may be working with. So we bring them in. Uh, we have this Eric students or other social workers might go through an education session where they may be taught about HIV. Uh, they may be taught how to talk about HIV with their peers. In turn, though, they give us some information as well. They tell us, okay, I'm friends with so-and-so. I'm, I'm not friends with this other person. This allows us to get better information about the network that we are working with. So now we can be more clever about the next set of youth that we choose. Now we bring the next set of youth in. They, we give them information. They give us back information about the network. And now we can be clever about the, the third set of youth that we bring in. And so we have this adaptive policy that is needed where, based on the information we gather, we'll change um, the selections we make. This is no longer a single shot decision problem uh, as traditionally done in influence maximization work. Uh, this problem is NP-hard, and it's not adaptive submodular. 
So let's talk about now this decision making, sequential decision making under uncertainty. And here we start talking about uh, using a POMDP to try to solve this problem. So our homeless shelter is going to sequentially choose a set of nodes. And so it's going to choose as an action a set of youth that we will select in every round. And these youth will then give us information about which edges exist in the network. And so what we now have is a policy, an adaptive policy. And in order to generate this policy, we need a POMDP solver that can solve for this policy. Now, unfortunately, this turns out to be a very hard problem to solve because the number of uh, states and actions is very massive. And current offline and online POMDP solvers uh, do not scale up. So for example, if you look at the state of the art online solvers, they can go to about 30 uh, nodes. We need we have graphs that at least have 10 times that size. And offline solvers can hardly scale up to uh, less than, you know, more than 10 nodes. So what can we do? So one thing we notice, uh, rather Amulya noticed, is that uh, in these graphs there is a community structure. Kids that uh, play basketball together or kids that may be hanging out on a beach together. So there is a certain community structure. Within a community, the kids are uh, tightly connected, but across, not so much. And so we can do graph partitioning to show that, uh, indeed, these graphs can be partitioned. If you look at uh, two of the homeless uh, youth networks that Eric has data for, uh, Venice and Hollywood, that uh, we can look at that. And if we do partitioning, we can see that in the Hollywood network, just about 12% of edges go across these partitions. So these networks are tightly uh, have these communities that we can harness in order to speed up our algorithms. So we are going to take our uh, big POM DP. We're going to apply graph partitioning to create intermediate smaller scale POM DPs. Unfortunately, even these intermediate smaller scale POM DPs are hard to solve. And therefore, we are going to do some graph sampling. So we create these sampled POM DPs, and these are now uh, going to be easier to solve. So this is how it's all going to work. We start with a big uh, graph. We are going to partition it to create these intermediate POM DPs. Now, what this means is we are going to ignore uh, cross-community edges. So we're giving up on some solution quality. It turns out, though, that these intermediate uh, POM DPs are hard to solve. So we're going to create sampled POM DPs. And by sampling, I mean we'll create, for example, the first sample is a graph where we took all the uncertain edges and we said none of those exist. Another sample, well, uh, you know, some of those edges exist, but some don't. So you can imagine creating lots of samples like these and then solving each of these, which can be solved. And what we get there are values for each of our actions. And then we can take an expectation to figure out which is the action that gives us the highest expected value within a partition. Now, if we know the uh, youth we will select within a partition, then we can sort of combine together all the solutions from the different partitions. And that way, we get which youth we should call in for intervention in any one step. So that's one way to create this work, uh, create this intervention. But uh, there is another algorithm. This was uh, work uh, done by Brian Wilder. And in this, uh, he talked about using a greedy approach. So in the greedy approach, basically, we're going to select youth uh, that give us the maximum expected utility right now, but it's not going to look into the future. And so it's going to select at each point in time the set of youth that give us the maximum gain in, a, in that round itself. Now we are going to take into account the cross-community edges, but we are not looking ahead. So we are giving up solution quality either way, but in different ways. Um, so these are uh, going to show you some uh, simulation results here on, on the x-axis of the two different uh, networks, Venice and Hollywood. And on the y-axis is amount of indirect influence. This is simulation. We'll talk about real-world tests a little, little later on. We're going to look at how many non-peer leaders would get influenced by using healer, which are the algorithms that I mentioned, versus traditional methods. Degree centrality, which is shown in gray, that's a traditional method. Bring in the most popular youth. A CR is community random, so you divide up uh, the graph into communities and pick people at random. Uh, and so forth. And you can see that the healer algorithms are achieving significantly more information spread compared to these other traditional methods. So this gives us some uh, indication that these algorithms are going to work well, but this is simulation. Now, before we go on to applying this in the real world, there's one more point uh, that I brought up earlier. 
we had relied on point estimates uh, of probabilities of propagation and existence of edges. But these are hard to come by, and what we need is essentially some sort of relaxation of that assumption. And this can be done instead of assuming that we are given point probabilities, that there are ranges of values. So for example, the probability that this edge exists is not exactly 0.75, but is within a range 0.4 to 0.8. And so now we want policies that are robust uh, to these different value ranges. So this can be done by casting this problem as a game. So on the one side, we have nature, who's going to be, uh, in this case, assumed to act against us. So it's going to choose values for parameters uh, of uh, probability of propagation, existence of edges, so as to cause our policy the most harm. And our algorithm is now going to choose policies uh, that obviously is going to maximize the worst case. The payoffs here are some ratio of the optimal that would be chosen if you knew these values of PAB and UAB versus the, uh, you know, the value that we would get from what we have generated as a policy. So essentially this game would look something like this. The influencer, the homeless shelter, is going to choose these policies. And nature is going to choose some parameter values. And so the payoff then is the ratio that I mentioned. What we want to find an equi is the equilibrium point of this game, and that would give us the policy to play. Unfortunately, this game is massive. Uh, in fact, on the nature side, uh, clearly you can pick values from an infinite range of values. It turns out, though, that we can discretize nature's play and bound the loss in solution quality. But even with that, uh, there's still a very, very large number of values to pick. So the game is very massive. You can't uh, put this in computer memory and solve for equilibrium. So the way this can be done is uh, by a double oracle approach. So we start with a small game with initialized number of player strategies, influencer strategies, and nature strategies. And then uh, there's a nature's oracle, which will do a best response to your equilibrium strategies. And then there's a, and nature will say, I'll add this additional strategy, which is my best response. And then the influencer will play its best response, and it will say, I can add this strategy, that's my best response. And you grow the game in this fashion, iterating with the best responses of nature and influencer until you converge. And this converged solution then is the solution to the original game um, with the discretized values for nature. So this is a way in which we can solve massive scale games, this double oracle approach. Unfortunately, it turns out the number of iterations we need to converge empirically turn out to be small, and so we can converge fairly quickly. And so, uh, and under some conditions, we can provide some approximation guarantees. Um, this is again in simulation, and Eric will talk next about uh, pilot results of pilot tests. And so we're looking here at the two networks, comparing Healer++, which is the robust algorithm, to these ranges of uncertainties, versus the original algorithm, which did not have this robustness, and looking at what would happen in the worst case. And it's showing that the dark green bar, which is the newer algorithm, performs better in the worst case compared to the original algorithm that did not have this robustness built in. So these are all simulation results. They're promising, but these are simulation results. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Eric uh, to talk about the pilot tests that were done. So I'm enough of a math nerd that I was really excited about those results. But uh, the real world is, is always the, the testing ground for such a thing. And so enter my PhD students. <clears throat> so Robin Petering, Jay Akratik, and Amanda Yoshioka Maxwell. And particularly Robin Petering, uh, who is really instrumental in designing the actual intervention protocol. You know, what do we do on a day in and day out basis once we have this algorithm in hand when we're actually working with these young people? And so what we, what we do in short, uh, based on what the the work that Healer or Healer++ gives us is that we take uh, an, an existing network. So we would go out, we went out to the field, and in this uh, pilot studies, what we did was we recruited about 60 youth, and we did this three different times. So we tested the original version of Healer, we tested uh, Brian's updated version of Healer, and then we tested degree centrality, which is the standard public health way, pick the most popular people. And in each case, we would go out, we would recruit uh, about 60 young people into the study, and we would find out what their network ties were to one another, 
And then we would provide that network data to either Brian or Amelia, who would then crunch their algorithm on that data and provide us with a pick you know, go and work with these particular four young people this week. And then we would get more network data from them at the time that we did the training with them. And then we would feed that new information back into the algorithm. And we repeated this process uh, three times until we got to this uh, desirable spot of having about 20% of the, the young people trained as peer leaders. So what we actually do in this space, and this is just a, a picture of what the space within Safe Place for Youth looks like where most of this work was done, was that we train young people about HIV prevention. So it's a one, so we bring the group of four young people in and we do a one day intensive training. It takes about four hours and we teach them about sexual health, which they haven't had since they were in high school and most of these young people have dropped out of high school and so it's been a long time since, they, since they've had accurate sexual health information. And we also teach them some critical things about leadership skills, about communication skills, and also about taking care of themselves and, and regulating their emotions. We then send them off with the task that they've been energized to do, which is to share this information with their friends, and hopefully their friends will share it with their friends. But what we're really mostly interested in is thinking about you know, how much of this network can our peer leaders, this small group of 20%, reach the, you know, in terms of the rest of these young people? And then subsequently, how much change did we get in their HIV testing behaviors? Because that's really the thing that we're concerned with here is identifying new young people for HIV who have HIV infection so that we can link them into the healthcare system and make sure that they don't die from this disease, which is a very much a manageable chronic disease if you have the right sort of treatment. So what we found when we did this, much to our surprise and delight, was that it worked, right? And it worked wildly well. So what we found out was that when we did both of the versions of Healer, about 70% of the rest of the network got messages from the peer leaders. So our peer leaders that the algorithm picked were great at doing their work. Our peer leaders that were picked from the popularity algorithm, not as good, 27%. I mean, this is certainly better than just the initial 20% that we got, but it's, not, but it's not that impressive. The HIV testing results are even more dramatic. So what we found was that among the young people who needed to get a new HIV test that got reached by these messages, so the people that got a message from one of these peer leaders that then said, oh, wow, yeah, I got to go get an HIV test. I haven't been tested in the last six months. About a third of the young people who were reached by these messages changed their behaviors and went and got an HIV test in the AI versions of the study. But in the popularity version of the study, no one knew got a new HIV test. And this is the one month result. So this is essentially right after we finished training this group of young people up and deploying them uh, with their friends. And part of this is because of the way that the algorithm works, okay? Healer and Healer++ had a very small number of redundant edges. So there was a lot, when you got these young people, they had separate parts of the network that they were able to influence. Whereas when you picked the most popular people, there was a lot of redundancy. The, the joke we make about this is that it's sort of the difference between the high school football team and the breakfast club. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie from the 80s. I know I'm dating myself by even mentioning it, but when I was a teenager, there was a really popular movie called The Breakfast Club and all these, and what happened was that these kids from these different social cliques had detention on a Saturday morning together. So you had a, a jock, a princess, a nerd, a stoner, a goth, and they didn't know one another. They got to they got together for this Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning, all day detention, whatever, became, let their guards down, became friends, had this great moment of bonding, and then they went back out into the world, back to their social worlds. That dynamic was exactly what we saw when we brought in these young people from these different social cliques that the, that the network partitioning was looking for. When we did popularity, it was essentially like pulling out the high school football team. These are people who are very... In, uh, in, there aren't football players on the streets. These are skater kids if it's on the streets. So these very popular, very cool skater kids, everybody likes them, or at least a lot of people like them, but really a lot of that is that they like one another as well. So there's a lot of redundancy of how they're interconnected with one another, and then this sort of core group of hangers-on that wants to be these cool kids. And there's not really enough penetration into the rest of the network. 
And so you can see in terms of community coverage, when we do the healer and healer plus plus because of the way that we've designed the algorithms, we got to all of the sub communities. Whereas when we did popularity, we didn't even, we kind of barely got past half of the sub communities. But the really cool stuff about this was actually what happened to the young people who were a part of it. So these two guys are actual peer leaders who are in our intervention. And there's two things that I want to share with you about these. First of all, these guys are not the typical folks who would get pulled into an intervention. In fact, both of these people got sort of a sideways confused dog look from the providers when we pulled them in. They're like, those are going to be your peer leaders? And part of this is because there's a, and actually this is the case for both of these young men in this picture, they have some pretty serious attention deficit disorder issues. And they're really all over the place, really hard to work with. And so as an agency, this is not gonna be your first thought of, if we could pick, we're gonna pick somebody who's gonna be kind of a spaz and gonna make our, our intervention difficult. But our algorithm said, no, these guys are really important. These guys have key connections to key sub-communities that we must reach and that these guys can reach way better than anybody else. And it turned out, I mean, you can see these smiling, happy faces, right? This was such an empowering thing for these guys. Both of these young men are currently now a year or so after this intervention. They both have housing. They both have jobs. They have stable lives that they had not had for years. And this wasn't even the point of the intervention, right? The point of the intervention was let's spread HIV prevention knowledge. But it had this wonderful, unexpected human aspect of it, which was that these young people who'd largely been overlooked, even by well-meaning social workers and well-meaning you know, social work researchers like myself, who when I did a, my early pilot version of this study about seven, eight years ago, I did this sort of typical thing. Let's pick some people that seem like they'd be good at, good at doing this from some sort of way of us evaluating who's a good kid or looks like they'd be easy to work with. And I would have left out these guys as well because they're just hard to work with. But it turns out that it was not only were they good at doing the work, as you saw from the slides before, but it was this pivotal point in their lives that an algorithm saw not a human. And this is an amazing thing to see in AI research, which so often is given a bad rap for having all of these unexpected dis sources of discrimination and bias. I'll make the argument, not in every case, but at least in this case, when you're thinking about networks as the data that you're driving, sometimes these algorithms can actually prevent bias. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can actually hear, for, hear it from the people you that were there. a way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world like and how we can we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing it could really help out a lot of, of youth. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Milland who I think is going to talk to us about oh uh, well I guess I can do next steps very very briefly which is that um, we are planning on doing a massive implementation of this study. We started the enrollment for it about a month ago. Over the next two years, we're going to enroll 300 youth into healer, 300 youth into a observ pure observational condition, and then 300 youth into the regular popularity condition. And moving forward, we have an enormous number of exciting projects in this center. So we are working on uh, substance abuse prevention issues. We are working on suicide prevention issues, both in uh, college campuses as well as within the military. We're also working on housing for homeless youth in terms of working with systems that provide housing and how to help them create um, matching systems that more efficiently and effectively allocate housing to youth. We're working on North Korean refugee adolescents in South Korea and how to help better integrate them into society. We're working on tuberculosis prevention in India, and we're also working on gang violence prevention here in Los Angeles. And I'm gonna turn it over to Millen to talk about the other areas that we're working on. Okay, so uh, uh, we have uh, limited time left, so this pretty much uh, gives you hopefully an insight into one particular project in AI for low resource communities and some of the ongoing work at our center. But there are, as I said, three areas uh, of work. I wanted to highlight uh, some of the work that will go on in the public safety and security uh, space. 
So that's a, a MURI project that uh, we have that's going to get launched. And uh, these are our partners, CMU and UTEP and ASU and so on. The project in, is on realizing cyber inception. Uh, this is for uh, cyber defense using, um, uh, you know, basically ideas from the movie Inception. That was the motivation for this uh, MURI. Uh, but it's truly something uh, more something like this. Uh, but basic idea is uh, working with psychologists and so uh, in order to understand how adversaries may think and apply this for AI for social good, whether it's working with the Wildlife Conservation Society or uh, trying to prevent human trafficking and so forth, as well as other challenges that we face. Yesterday, in uh, talking to uh, some of the mentees, uh, the issue of you know what what to do in the future came up. I also wanted to highlight in the same space of uh, public safety and security one other career path that uh, some of you may uh, may or may not have thought about, and that's a, a startup. And so we have uh, the startup Avata Intelligence, uh, which has taken some of the work that I mentioned on public safety and security, and now there's this uh, startup company. Uh, the company has their own set of clients so where some of the work is uh, getting used. And as I say, we are actually selling game theoretic equilibrium and making money from it. So I'll end here by talking about the need for human-machine partnerships in these domains involving uh, AI for social good. What we're doing here are building decision aids, building assistance, where humans focus on their expertise. So social workers interacting with homeless youth, and the AI systems focus on complementary <laughs> tasks, which is selecting influential youth. So it's really a partnership. We are not building robots that would go and uh, uh, talk to the homeless youth, for example. But there are, the, there are important lessons in building these assistants. We have to have the right level of autonomy for you in this partnership. Um, if we micromanage humans too much, then that's not going to be a good outcome. For example, yesterday, uh, Faye may have mentioned to you work on you know, locating snares in forests. Well, we can point roughly the area, you know, maybe a 500 meter by 500 meter area. But where poachers may hide snares, that's a level of expertise that the rangers in the field know better. And so we can leave that work to them, focusing only on tasks where the algorithms know what to do well. Uh, Bistra mentioned yesterday the importance of interpretability, of explanation uh, during the panel. And that's clearly going to be an important issue as we build these uh, partnerships. And uh, there's also a partnership not only between the AI and the human who's using it, but partnership between researchers and the organization where we are deploying this AI. And this requires us to immerse ourselves in the workings of this organization. We can't here sit at USC in our labs and just sort of say, well, here's how we know, you know, this is going to work. We have to actually go in the field, whether it's in the homeless shelters, whether it's in Africa, or, or on the Coast Guard boats or on checkpoints of the police and so forth to understand how things really work. And that's where we get the right sorts of knowledge, understand the right kinds of constraints and so on. So our time's up. So we'll end by saying there's tremendous potential for AI for social good. And that's the focus of our center. Um, and we you know, would love to have further collaborations. And at this point, we'll stop and take questions. Thank you. So I guess uh, you're asking, you know, how, how do you know these probabilities? And that's exactly, that's a really great question. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why our emphasis was on trying to relax that assumption and add uncertainty over the ranges of values. And that's where all these algorithms are going. But you can see that even with the limited information that we did have uh, for these probabilities of propagation and so forth, the algorithms still beat what was being done traditionally. Uh, and this is true of many of these domains. You need uh, some exact information, whether it's payoffs in the game or uh, you know, some, something about animal density and so forth. The point is that even if we don't know these values exactly, even if we approximately guess it, the algorithms 
even with that limited information, far outpace what humans are able to do in these very complicated tasks. So certainly that's a very important topic to work on, uh, trying to deal with that uncertainty, maybe uh, figuring out how to gather that information, um, you know, and so the value of information and all those sorts of things are very, very important. But that shouldn't hinder us from inserting our techniques in the field because we can see a lot of benefit over what humans are able to do. You know, one of the other things that I've said in, in, in response to this comment before is that within social science, especially applied social sciences like social work science, we often know a lot about the domain, an enormous amount, but part of what we know is we understand very deeply what we don't exactly know. So for instance, this idea of this propagation probability. We know that young people have an influence on one another's behaviors. I mean, we have paper after paper after paper that you know my research group alone has generated looking at how people are influencing one another. But the sort of very, very specific parameter that you need to put into one of these models is essentially impossible to measure in people, or nearly impossible. So what we really need to do instead is say, this is something that we know happens, and we know that it happens some of the time, even most of the time, but there's a range, you know, and, and then that human behavior is very idiosyncratic at moments, and it's not always going to be the same probability, and even between two people at two different points in time, it's not going to be the same probability. So actually factoring in a modeling solution that doesn't treat that as a known parameter, but treats that as something that is uncertain, is a much more accurate depiction of the real world. And that's, I think, to me, what was one of the most exciting things about this work, was that when we started talking, and I started talking about all of the stuff that I didn't know. That was the place where Milland was able to come in and say, oh, well, we can model that. That's great. We, you, know, you just know enough about what you don't know for us to actually create a space. And then you, know, you get really clever graduate students like, like Brian who then say, here's this really complicated game theoretic way of relaxing this assumption and still having a robust solution that's going to pick really good peer leaders that then actually works in the real world, even if you don't know these parameters. So yeah, the question is, you know, how do these young people get HIV testing? So there's there's an enormous number of free HIV testing locations all around the U.S. and in uh, in Los Angeles in particular. And so one of the things that we teach the homeless youth in this intervention is where those locations are. And there's actually even some uh, testing facilities in L.A. that will give you a small stipend like five dollars for coming and getting an HIV test if you're under a certain poverty threshold just to encourage people that are in high-risk populations to get this testing and so I actually had a group of peer leaders in one of these conditions that created a, a sheet of places that would pay you five bucks to get an HIV test that they would go up to people that were their friends and be like hey do you need five bucks and their friend would be like yeah of course I didn't like go get tested you know and so I mean these are some, some of the clever ways that they dealt with this and so you know part of it is them you know they survive on the streets by this sort of this sort of way of doing things anyway and so this was them focusing this kind of clever resource gathering that they're always about and spreading through their networks anyway but in a much more sort of positive pro-social way um, than they might have done without this as an impetus. So the, the thought with the CDC's major approach to dealing with HIV in the U.S. right now is what they call the HIV treatment cascade. And the idea is that if, you, if everyone who is infected can find out that they're infected and get into treatment, the antiretroviral drugs that are available now will re reduce the viral load that is in your blood and semen to be zero, essentially, which makes you non-transmissible to somebody else. So the, the dream of HIV prevention, really, from the CDC's standpoint, is get everybody who's infected tested. And so what you really want to do with a group like this is you want to really encourage two things. I mean, you want to encourage them to get tested so they can get linked into this thing. So part of it is a pattern of regular testing. Because sometimes young people think, well, oh, I got an HIV test once. I'm OK. And they don't think oh, I've been having sex with other people since then, and my sexual network keeps changing, and uh, that HIV test I had was more than six months ago, and because of the, the, the way that the virus takes 
it's six months for the antibodies to show up in your bloodstream. The tests are only good for a six month window. You need to keep getting tested. And the other part is that we're encouraging them to use condoms. And I didn't present the condom use results here. They're a little bit slower in their uptake. But again, we saw the same thing that we saw here, which is that condom use became, uh, was much more um, adopted by the healer version of things than it was by the degree centrality version of things. Again, I think because there was more connectivity within spaces that was important to these young people. Should we end now? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.